in philosophy of mind, the most popular view, the most commonly defended view of the mind over the last 50 or years or so is functionalism. And this is part one. We'll look at the definition of functionalism, try to get a grip on what the thesis is, and then we'll look at some arguments for functionalism. Of course, any theory that's been around that long has a wide variety of types now. I'm going to be as generic as I can in this video. So what is functionalism? In order to understand the theory itself, we really need to think about the, the idea of functional concepts. So let's walk through this. The, the definition we can provide here for functionalism is that the mind is a collection of functional states in a physical medium. Now that may not quite make sense yet, so let's try to explore it, expand on it, and figure out what we're talking about here. But you see that key idea, a collection of functional states, but it is in a physical medium. So in order to think this through, we need to differentiate between function concepts and stuff concepts. Yes, sometimes philosophers get very creative and use very complex words like stuff. So what are stuffs? Well, water, wood, gold, these things are stuffs, right? For a stuff, it's the physical composition that matters. It's not the size or the shape. So wood can still be wood if it's fresh from a tree or if it's part of a desk. Water is water, whether it's ice or in a liquid form. And if you have something in a, in a jar that's uh, H2O2 that looks like water, it certainly flows like water, but it would be hydrogen peroxide, not H2O, which is water. So that would be something else. And obviously the gold has to be the element gold. So it's the physical composition of the stuff that matters when we're talking about a stuff concept. And of course, we can change the shape, the size. It doesn't matter if it's the same stuff. Now, on the other hand, in contrast to stuffs, we have things like a doorstop or a mousetrap or a lectern. These are functional concepts. So a lectern as long as it's able to hold notes that you could set on a desk, right, in front of a classroom, something like that. It could be made of wood, it could be made of, of concrete for that matter, it could be made of plastic, it could be made of all kinds of different things, as long as it has this shape so that it can function to hold your notes. And of course, mousetraps are made in many, many different ways. Some are just boxes, some are complex uh, combinations of wood and springs and so on. A doorstop uh, could be a nice rubber doorstop, which typically are fairly efficient. Sometimes they're plastic. Um, around Morgan Hall here at Western Illinois University, we have a lot of wooden doorstops. Those don't work quite as well, but uh, you could use a concrete block and even I could be a doorstop. That's how I can help people move by holding the door open. And in these ideas, right, the function is what's important. The material that the things are made of don't really matter. It's the role that the things play that matters. So uh, that's why you can have a wide variety of materials and, and doorstops, of course, can be in different sizes and shapes, as I suggest. Besides your typical uh, shape of a doorstop, you could just have a big block or even a person could serve as a doorstop. So it's the function that's important. So what does functionalism say about the mind then? Obviously, the idea is that the mind is a functional concept. It's not a stuff. So just as a doorstop could be made of different materials, just as aerobic exercise could take on different forms like running or swimming or biking or Zumba or the traditional aerobics, right? 
the functionalist then will claim that the brain is just one type of material that's complex enough to allow a mind to function. You could have a, a mind within other materials. It doesn't have to be a human brain. So what other possibilities are there? Well, stick with me here, but uh, silicon structures, computers, even water pipes that are appropriately connected in a complex way could serve to function as a mind, as long as these things can perform the complex interactions that our neurons do. Now, there's somewhat of a caveat here because they're going to have to be very complex, right? Because our brain is very complex. What we need to run the mind, so to speak, has over a hundred billion neurons. And so that's why we're not yet there in, says the functionalist, in terms of building computers, that would be the, the main thing that we have that might come close to be getting as complex as a human brain. And in fact, with computers, we have an analogy. The analogy is with the software that computers run. So the idea is that the mind is a set of relationships, right? This, this functional set of relationships that we've mentioned, functional states. And it's a relationship among input, the processing, and output. And that's similar to how a computer functions, right? So with a computer, we have input through keystrokes on a keyboard, through mouse clicks, through the movement of the mouse. So that's our input typically with more, uh, more commonly, we have also, of course, computers that are voice activated. So uh, an Echo device or a Google Home or all kinds of other voice activated devices now would serve as input. Then you have processing, what's going on within the computer itself, and then you have output. So the output could be showing up on your monitor, the, the, cha the change in what your monitor is displaying. It could be what's going to your printer. It could be what's playing on your speakers, right? This various output according to the input and the processing. And so the functionalist is claiming that the mind is very much like that. So we have input, and that would be the environment affecting the mind through our body. So uh, our senses, of course, what we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell, those are interacting with other mental states that we have, our memories, our hopes, our desires, our emotions, those kinds of things. And then the mind would direct a response in the body. So uh, a sensation of pain uh, might cause the mind to direct the hand, if it's in your hand, to pull away from something that's too hot, for example. So uh, the functionalist says that the mind is very much like software running on the computer. And just like software then, a mind could be run in many different forms. And the science fiction idea of being able to download one's mind would fit with the functionalist theory of the mind, right? So uh, this, we have people who hope that we may be able to do this some way. It makes for great science fiction. And so there are movies and books uh, written and, and movies developed with this concept. Uh, the Sixth Day is one. Uh, not many people have heard about it. You can look it up. There's a new Amazon series as I am recording this. It's new. Uh, might date this video, but it's called Upload, and you have that capacity. There's a, a movie with Johnny Depp in it called Transcendence, which is a very interesting idea of uploading one's mind. So, that's the idea that that is possible if functionalism is correct. Okay, so why should we think functionalism is true? Let's consider a, a very broad kind of general argument for functionalism. 
And as I'm defining it again, functionalism is the idea that the mind is a collection of functional states in a physical medium. So one of the premises is that the mind is intimately associated with the brain. The brain is the physical medium that runs the mind. So if you mess around with the brain, if there's any damage in the brain, then that's going to cause problems with running the mind. So we have all kinds of cases that support this. We talked about these in the video on the identity theory, so trauma to the head, uh, the success of psychiatric treatment with medicine, uh, the effects of alcohol or marijuana or other chemicals on the brain. We see this through MRIs and EEGs that measure what's going on in the brain when our mind is doing different things. We see this with the effects of stroke and so on. So we have this intimate connection of the mind and the brain. And yet the functionalist argues that we could have a mind without the brain, right? So there's reason to think that the mind is not identical with the brain. Again, that was explained in our, our videos on the identity theory. We have good reason to think that they are not exactly the same thing, but clearly dependent on the brain. So this makes sense that you could have a mind without a brain, but you would need some other physical object to run the mind. Now, computing theory, artificial intelligence theories provide an excellent model for the mind. And the best explanation of these things is that the mind is a collection of functional states in a brain, or it could be in a computer, or maybe in an alien that has no brain that we would recognize similar to the human organ, the brain. So that just is functionalism. So our broad argument here, we take these things known about the mind and we say that the best explanation of all this is functionalism. And there certainly are some advantages of functionalist theory, especially contrasting this with some of the theories we've already considered. This avoids the problems of chauvinism, right? The, the bias against certain types of materials that the identity theory faced. That's what ID, identity theory. Um, functionalism allows the mind to separate from the brain. So some of the arguments that were motivating dualism actually might be in somewhat of a support of functionalism. And yet, of course, functionalism maintains physicalism, so it doesn't have the same problems that we raise with dualism. And then finally, we can apply functionalism in a variety of ways. And so, for example, we have what's called the Turing test, which was uh, developed by Alan Turing. That's uh, why his name. So this. He thought of this in the 1940s, but the idea is imagine that you could have a conversation, so to speak, with a computer program. And if you could be fooled by the computer program into thinking that you're having an actual conversation with another person, then that program has passed the Turing test. So we, we have contests now to see if people can create programs that will pass the Turing test. And today, of course, unlike in the 1940s, we can easily do this with um, uh, messaging uh, services. You know, uh, you can imagine uh, text-based services that you have on your phone or your computer, and you could have some with a real person and some with a, a bot or artificial intelligence of some kind. And if the interlocutor, the person you're conversing with, at least whatever the, the text you have that you're interacting with, if you're convinced that it's a person, then that if, but it's really a program, well, Turing argued that it actually is a mind. It is a person. So we have things like, again, in science fiction, there was a movie uh, with, called Her, where someone fell in love with their artificial intelligence device, imagine a, an echo device 
highly evolved and you can have conversations with it, well, uh, that's what the idea was there. He began to believe uh, the program was a person. And as the movie went on, the program, in fact, was a person in the context of science fiction. So that's the idea. Functionalism gives you the basis for thinking about the mind in these various ways that are very interesting. We avoid some of the problems of the identity theory and we avoid some of the problems of the dualist theory. So it looks pretty good. However, of course, we're gonna go on in part two and consider some problems with functionalism. And these are going to be also some problems with physicalism broadly, at least some of those are. So uh, consider part two, watch that video next.